day that the Lord hath made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, blessed be God. Here we are again for your divine appointment, which is the media ministry of the Divine Jackson MD Ministries. I'm Dr. Jackson, and we're here to study the International Sunday School lesson called Thursday School, which is Sunday School on Thursday. Oh, blessed be God. We're glad for the privilege to study. And what a glorious lesson it is we have to study for this the 30th of October, 2022. The Lord has been good to us to reach this last Sunday of the month of October, and we're glad you've joined us. You're in the right place at the right time. We bless God and want to let you know that these uh, recordings of the uh, lessons are available on our multiple social media platforms, 24 hours a day on demand. If you've missed any of the lessons, you can go back and study them at any time. And not only that, we also have a bonus study that we do call the Bible Spotlight. And uh, the Spotlight will occur at various times uh, during the lesson, taking almost as a commercial break as we do our ongoing study in the Bible Spotlight. For those of you that are new, uh, joining with us, we're so delighted that you've come. Uh, welcome to Thursday School. For those of you that have been with us, and some of you have been with us these entire three years, we just celebrated our third anniversary earlier this month, our third anniversary of Thursday School. We want to thank you for being along with us. So we bless the Lord. Uh, and we want to let you know also that if you would kindly subscribe to our YouTube channel, it makes a difference so we can reach more souls because we have one agenda here and one only, and that is to bring glory to Christ by the spreading of his sweet word. We would appreciate that. And those of you on Facebook, please like and share. We would appreciate that as well. Well, let's pray. Lord, we love you and we bless you and we praise you. We glorify you for the gift of life, not only life on this earth, but eternal life in the world to come. We bless you for it. Thank you for my brothers, sisters, and friends that have joined to study your sweet word together. Now, Lord, you be the professor. Teach us, Lord. There's so much that you want us to know. Teach us. Make us ready to receive and to live the yes, Lord, life. This we pray in Jesus' name and amen. Praise the Lord. Well, this blessed lesson is found uh, in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 16, and our subject today is David, anointed king. Um, and it goes through verses 1 through 13 of 1 Samuel 16. Hopefully you have your Bible. If you're driving in your vehicle and what have you, we'll do the reading for you. Praise God. <laughs> Glory to God. Well, this book here, 1 Samuel, uh, uh, we bless God because uh, the author of the book, we know, uh, uh, many call him the boy prophet because his mother Hannah was barren. We know the beautiful story there at the beginning of the book of 1 Samuel. She was barren. She uh, asked the Lord to give her a son and said, Lord, if you give me a son, I'll give him back to you. And that's just what she did. And by the way, if we make a vow to the Lord, we need to be careful and diligent to keep it. Amen. Scripture says the Lord is not requiring us to make these additional vows but if we vow, we need to pay what we have promised. Amen? Walk in truth and sincerity before the Lord our God. And so Samuel, from a boy, grew up there uh, in the uh, tabernacle. And Eli was the uh, high priest and the judge. And all the tremendous story, how he grew up. And from his uh, childhood, learned the ways of God. And then, of course, the Lord anointed him to be a prophet. And he was also the last judge and anointed the first king. Well, that first king's name was Saul. And we'll see a few things about Saul in the lesson today. And Saul, the scripture says, Saul, when you were small in your own eyes, when you were humble, you were doing well. But when you became arrogant, proud, a disobedient, jealous, and all these other spirits, hallelujah, came together, spirits travel together. And we need to know that. Uh, behaviors travel together. But behaviors are often underwritten and empowered by spirits. And we want our behavior to be underwritten and empowered by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. Well, if we refuse the Spirit of God, then these multitude of other spirits are able to influence our behaviors. And Saul went from a place of humility, right, to a place of arrogance. Well, his pride which essentially pride is self-worship, now opened the door for other spirits to come in. 
And we have a biblical reference for that. So many things uh, over in the book of Luke, how when spirits are cast out, they go, so to speak, into dry places, the scripture des describes. And so they're looking for a place to go. They say, well, let me go back to the place where I was cast out of and see if I can re-inhabit. Oh, there's so much in that. Hallelujah. So our heart is to be kept pure and upright before the living God and Holy Spirit. Dwell within and reign and rule. You be the sole occupant of my soul. I don't want any other spirits in there but the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so now Saul, having uh, uh, drifted away from the Lord, now uh, in addition to his pride, now jealousy has come in. And he has fits of rage and anger. And uh, um, he now finds himself disobeying God in multiple ways and even consulting a, a medium. These were persons that were to be put out of Israel. We're not trying to get information through any other uh, methodology. We're not to consult any other spirit, but the spirit of the living God only. Hallelujah. The believer is not to look to the stars. It's not to look to astrology and horoscopes and tarot cards and palm readings or any other spiritism. We don't engage in any of that. The scripture is absolutely clear. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, the Lord God, and he shall direct our path. We're not looking for a direction from any other methodology because it will be perverted by the evil one. Oh, glory to God. And so Saul found himself with a compounding situation of sin. And just like sin can be compounded, what you and I want is a compounding of righteousness. Go from love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and meekness, goodness, temperance, faith. Oh, what a beautiful compounding. That's a beautiful list. That's what we want uh, multiplied in our lives. And so Saul, having fallen to this, our lesson opens as the reign of Saul is going to be coming to an end and God's about to anoint a new king. This new king will not occupy the throne immediately. There will be years intervening in there, things going on where God is uh, both merciful to Saul, but also God is working things in the preparation of the new king. You and I must remember, even though we are called, we are purposed uh, uh, by God, we're, we're designed and destined to things in the Lord by God's planning, you and I must still go through the paces. We have to walk with the Lord, not run up ahead. Hallelujah. Because even though God has destined us for a thing, we still have to be prepared for it. If we step into the thing that is a part of our destiny, prematurely, if we step into it before the right time, we will not be able to fulfill it and even enjoy the fullness of it. Amen. A father may say uh, uh, to his eight-year-old son, son, here's a gold watch. Hallelujah. And it's yours. Or son, his eight-year-old son, this beautiful vehicle, this car is yours. And he and dad work on the car. They shine it up. He helps dad. But he can't drive it yet. He's only eight years old. The car's his, but he is not ready yet to sit in the driver's seat and put that thing into gear and take it anywhere. Are you with me? Even though the gift is his, there's a time and a season. And one of the worst things we can do, our pastor uses the term as people blessing themselves. One of the worst things we can do is feel the call, so to speak, to drive that beautiful car and say, God said the car is mine. One of the worst things we can do is to get under the wheel prematurely. Not only do we suffer loss, often the car is destroyed, but even the person themselves can suffer great injury and potentially even loss and injure others. Are you with me? So we have to wait on the Lord. Help me say, wait on the Lord. Oh, that's good scripture. Praise God. So we have to learn how to wait on God by walking with him, not trying to run ahead. Well, glory to God. Well, the book of 1 Samuel chapter 16, our verses are verses 1 through 13. And I'll be reading here in the King James Version. The scripture says, and the Lord said unto Samuel, notice this powerful statement. Now Saul has sinned. And here's what the Lord is saying to Samuel. Lord says to Samuel, how long are you going to mourn over Saul? Wow, what a question. It's a question and a challenge all in one. How long are you going to mourn for Saul 
seeing I have rejected him, the Lord God saying, I have rejected him from reigning over Israel. This is a powerful word because it comes to challenge all of us to examine if there are things we are mourning over, uh, we're grieving, we're bereaved about things. It's a perpetual funeral in our life. Sometimes we're grieved and bereaved over our past and mistakes we made and wrong decisions and, and the complications that were we have to ask the Lord to forgive us, admit our wrong, be willing to repent, which means to turn and leave the lifestyle that produced our past. But we can't mourn over the past forever. Why? Because God has a glorious future. He wants us to walk in today and not try to relive yesterday today. We can't undo yesterday. We can't relive yesterday. We have to go forward. Let that be forgiven and uh, left in the past and move forward. Here, Samuel is caught in per persistent mourning over what's gone on with Saul. And the Lord says, that mourning time is over. M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. The mourning, the grieving time is over. But it's time for M-O-R-N-I-N-G. It's a new morning, And God wants us to step into it. That's a word for somebody. Grieve no more. That funeral is over. Now it's time to arise and take action. Oh, glory to God. Help me celebrate that it's a new morning in the Lord. Glory to God. Well, the scripture says here, not only that, he says, fill your horn with oil. Now notice this. Samuel's not in position to get up and walk in what the Lord has for him to do until he's willing to let go of what was. You got to let that go, Samuel, because I've got something for you to do. Fill your horn with oil. Oh, glory to God. My brothers, sisters, and friends, this is a word. Hallelujah. You can't fill your own horn with oil and do what God has for you to do until you let go of what was. Oh, glory to God. Don't mourn too long. Hallelujah. Fill your horn with oil and go. How key. All through scripture, we see the admonition, that key word go, which actually we'll be talking about shortly. He says, fill it up and go, and I'm going to send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, meaning a man that lives there uh, uh, in Bethlehem, because look what the Lord says I've done. I have provided me a king amongst his sons. I've already chosen the new king. Now you, Samuel, my instrument, Fill up your horn, your instrument, fill it up with oil, and go to Bethlehem. Well, we see this next verse where there's a question that comes into play. And Samuel says, how can I go? Basically, Lord, how can I go down here and anoint a new king? If Saul finds out, he'll kill me. <laughs> and so he asked God this question. Now, this... uh. Uh, hearkens into a similar situation we see in the New Testament in Acts chapter 9 where the Lord tells the man of God Ananias to go anoint a Saul of Tarsus who we will know as the Apostle Paul. Go and uh, uh, pray, lay hands on him. Uh, his word to him was not to anoint him. His word was to go and to lay hands on him, pray for him. He's going to be recovered of his sight and so on. And, and you're going to tell him the things that he's going to uh, suffer. You're going to be prophesying to him. And Ananias is a question of the Lord. Uh, Lord, I've heard quite a few things about this Saul. He's around persecuting the church and all of this. And I just kind of check it in. You want me to go do what? with? <laughs> so many have misunderstood. There's a difference between asking God a question as these two instances we're describing. The prophet Samuel asked God a question. How can I go? And then Ananias asked the question, Lord, uh, Saul of Tarsus? It's okay. In fact, it's appropriate to ask God. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. We just quoted verse 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. That's verse 5. And then we just quoted verse 6. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Ask God. We're supposed to ask God. There's a difference between asking God a question, which we must do, and questioning God. The questioning of God is really when we challenge his authority. Questioning God is when we challenge God's 
authorization, God's uh, prerogative, hallelujah, God's sovereignty to make a decision that's contrary to what we want. And this sometimes happens when persons say, God took my loved one, God took this, God to, uh, I, I had these possessions and the storm came and God destroyed my belongings or my loved one died. He took my husband, took my wife, took my child. Uh, I had a high position and the company collapsed and I lost all that. God, wait now, wait now. The sovereignty of God is at work and we entrust ourselves to him. And we also have to consider there are multiple factors sometimes that are going on where some things we're accusing of God. When we look honestly, man has contributed out of his disobedience. And when we disobey God, the Bible already told us in Romans 3 and 23, those two scriptures go together, uh, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6 and 23, the wages of those sin is death. When we sin, it brings destruction. The scripture told us that. So when destruction comes, whether that loved one fell ill with a disease or whether there were tragedies and things gone on in business, a lot of these things, persons have sinned and their sin brought benefits which are destruction, whereas righteousness brings benefits or outcomes that are blessing. So sometimes we blame God for what we did. How unjust is that? So questioning God, challenging his authority, his sovereignty, and his prerogative as the God of the universe, we don't want to go there. But asking God a question, we're going to need to do that. And we've been invited. Come ask me, the Lord said. Oh, glory to God. Inquire of me. Glory to God. So much in this lesson. Well, he says, I don't go because Saul's going to kill me. And the Lord says, well, go when you go. Uh, offer a sacrifice. So Samuel obeys. He comes down to Bethlehem. And our next verse uh, says here in verse 3, uh, the Lord says, to uh, go and offer sacrifice. The Lord called Jesse to the sacrifice. And I'm going to show you, notice this now, I'm going to show you what you should do and who it is that you're going to anoint. Hallelujah. Who it is you're going to anoint, the one that I named to you. Whoever it is I identify to you, that's the one you anoint. Now, God didn't say how he was going to do the identification yet, but he says, I'm going to make it known who it is that is to be king, which means Samuel is not to presume and not to make his own selection, but get a direction from the Lord. Amen. Then uh, we come to verse four. Samuel does what the Lord uh, instructs him to do. He's obedient, fills his horn with oil, and he's on his way down to Bethlehem. He comes and he meets uh, into the city, and as he comes, the elders, uh, the leaders of the city are, are you coming peaceably? Uh, because when a prophet came to an area, he might have a word of judgment from the Lord. He might have a word of correction, a word of rebuke, hallelujah, a word that is of, of chastisement. Or he may come at a time when it is just a worship and it is celebratory. So are you coming peaceably? Uh, uh, Samuel, or are we in trouble? <laughs> this is significant because those uh, that say they have the prophetic gift. Now, notice in the New Testament, some of the offices are not identical to the offices that we see uh, uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, the New Testament, sometimes people confuse the gift of exhortation with those that are prophetic. Uh, because sometimes uh, the, where's the, the exhortations are things almost like a coach who is inspirational and encouraging and builds confidence and uh, uh, causes persons to faith to rise and they believe. They're down in the game. They're, uh, the game is almost over and their points are low, but the coach through an exhortation rallies the team to believe again that they can win the game. This is exhortation. Hallelujah, that it's in the house of God. The prophetic gift uh, is something that's not the same as exhortation. There are elements of it, but it's a separate gift. Sometimes what the prophetic uh, word is, it is a forth telling, which is the preaching, spreading of the gospel. Other times it is a futuristic foretelling. And that's not always, 100% of the time, 
what we would consider pleasant news. And some people will only tell people what they think that person wants to hear. That's not being true to what the Lord is saying. God might send something that is a word of warning. And we don't want to fail to give people warning because we just want everyone to be happy. We want them to celebrate and we want them to like us. We want to be running a popularity campaign. Lord, help us today. <laughs> the prophet, that's why they asked, are you coming peaceably? Because the same prophet that might come saying God's going to bless you in the morning might come to say judgment is at hand. Oh, blessed be God. Hallelujah. So we look and uh, Samuel comes and they, they say, and verse five, he says, we're coming peaceably and come here to sacrifice. And what you need to do is to sanctify yourselves uh, and come with me to the sacrifice. And so Samuel uh, sanctifies uh, uh, Jesse and his sons for them to prepare for sacrifice. Important principles here. The sacrifice, often they would build an altar and offer an animal sacrifice. And there were many different um, uh, sacrifices that were offered in the Old Testament. Some of them were uh, of grains of various kinds. You mix this particular flour and so on. So some of them are, were basically of vegetation. Others of them were animal sacrifices and they had different offerings for different purposes. But all of it was an act of worship toward God. And two elements. One is that we needed to, in the Old Testament, you see where they prepared themselves for worship. That principle remains, uh, precious ones, even though we're in New Testament times. We don't just approach unto God any kind of way. We need to prepare our hearts for worship. Amen? It's not an external procedure of washing your hands a certain number of times, things like that. But let there be sincerity. Let there be confession. Let there be repentance. Let there be a purity of heart, forgiving others, letting those things go. A purification of the heart for our relationship to God so that we can enter into a richness of worship. There's a way to approach the God and we should do it with a heart of sincerity, humility, repentance, and truth. Amen? Sanctify yourselves. Set yourselves apart. Prepare yourselves for worship. Secondly, when it says sacrifice, uh, that is a, as we described, an actual procedure. But because it is a worship, it is both corporate, everyone's doing it together, but it's also individual. And we, in New Testament times, when we have a, a sacrifice or offering time, time of giving of our finance to uh, uh, underwrite the ministry of the house of God, we must always remember it's still worship. Hallelujah. This is not a dismissal of the service. This is not an intermission. It's a part of the worship. And even though we're all giving at the same time, it's still a personal thing. God, I'm giving this that you have provided me to have, and I'm giving it into sowing into your kingdom as an act of worship and gratitude and thanksgiving, and I want to see the gospel reach the world. We need to make sure we keep offering time as a sacred time because it's worship. Oh, glory to God. And it want to always give with the right attitude, not grudgingly, of necessity, but with a cheerful heart, glad to sow to advance the kingdom of God. Oh, glory to God. So he comes and he says, and he, uh, prepares the sons to get them ready for worship. Now, uh, we're going to take a break at this particular time, but we'll come back to our lesson. But we're going to break now for our Bible spotlight. Glory to God. We are so excited because in our Bible spotlight, as you know, over these last many weeks, we have been covering the great commission of the church. Oh, glory to God. How the Lord has called and charged the church to spread the gospel to the world. And we have covered the passage in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 8. We've covered the passage in St. Mark chapter 16. Amen. We've covered multiple uh, passages of scripture. And we've covered Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. And now this is the fourth of the four. The last of the four that we want to cover is the one that classically or traditionally people call the passage of the Great Commission, which is Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Amen. And I'll be reading to you in the King James Version. The scripture says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. And this is how the book of Matthew ends. Well, what a passage. We First of all, we have three verses there. Um, actually, verse 18, um, I did not read. Verse 18 says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Then he goes into 19, Go ye therefore. Well, today in the spotlight, we're just beginning this passage. And the part we want to focus on is those three words of verse 19. Go ye therefore. Most persons uh, uh, in this verse just pass on through those and keep going. But it's critical. First, go. There's an instruction that the church's challenge is to take the truth to the world which does not know it. Take the light to the world because the world's in darkness. The charge upon the church is that we be actively and proactively getting the gospel to people. In Sunday school, which we're doing, uh, through Bible studies and through sermons, evangelistic crusades, outreach projects, service of the poor, missions work. The church does so many things. Children's ministries, music ministries, all kinds of things. But all of it is to get Christ to the world. The charge to do so, the goal, is for us. Amen? This is important because some take a uh, much less active role and expect the unbeliever to chase or pursue them. On occasion, unbelievers will come to us and inquire uh, of uh, the faith, the hope that's in us. And the scripture speaks about that. Be ready to give every man an answer concerning the hope that lies within you. That's all good. But the responsibility of the church to go, 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 that always has been and it always will be. And we want to always be preparing and engaging in active spreading of the word of God. That's essential. Go ye, ye, you, talking about uh, his disciples that were gathered unto him. And then the next word is therefore. Therefore, so you need to go, therefore, or you need to go because of. Because of what? And many passed over that, therefore. We have to go to the previous verse to find out why. It's verse 18. Verse 18 says, all power has been given unto me in heaven and earth. Therefore, you need to go. It is the fact that the Lord Jesus, the resurrected Christ, lives. And God the Father has given all power to him in heaven and where you are, disciples. All power has been given unto me in the earth. And because of that, you need to go. And then he goes and describes what you do when go. We, as the believers, are to be encouraged and to be strengthened in our going, knowing that the Lord, our Savior, has all power in his hands. Oh, glory to God. And we bless God. And we'll pick that up again on next time. Well, glory to God. Back into our lesson. We're here in verse 6. Verse 6 says, And it came to pass when they were come uh, that they looked on Eliab, and surely, and he said, surely, the Lord's anointed is before him. Now what we're talking about here in the lesson, uh, Samuel has arrived and Jesse uh, ha is here with his sons. And so uh, Jesse lines up the sons. Jesse has a total of eight sons, but only seven, uh, the, the seven oldest are here. And so now Samuel is, has been told the Lord, the Lord's going to uh, choose one of these sons. So the eldest son here uh, lines up, and when Samuel looks upon him, he says basically to himself, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Wow. The Lord says to Samuel, Samuel, don't look on the height of his stature. Basically, don't look at his height. Don't look at his countenance. Don't look at his physical appearance, right? Why? He says, because I have refused him. The Lord sees not as man sees. 
Man sees the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. This is key because Samuel is there to anoint a new king because the last king didn't work out. Well, the last king who was Saul, in Saul at 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 2, it said that Saul was tall. In fact, he was shoulders up taller than everybody else around. So he was tall and the Bible said he was handsome. He was good looking. And this is what people expected for a king. So his physical appearance made him seem like to them, this would be a king. Yes, God chose Saul, but he didn't want Israel to have a physical king. God was their king. The people pressed Samuel. We want a king like all the other nations. So the Lord gave them what they wanted. As they say, tall, dark, and handsome. But look what happened. Here Samuel is about to anoint the next king. And just often, this is a lesson for all of us. We can fall into the same pattern. Samuel is thinking like the mindset of what a king would physically look like. He's about to make that same mistake that the people's mindset was. Samuel told them the first time, listen, God's your king. You don't need a king. People wanted one, God gave him one. Now Samuel, as he's here about to anoint a king, is almost partaking of that same mindset and looking and saying, well, surely this is the Lord's anointing. Surely the Lord's anointing is right here before him. That's because of how he looked. And so the Lord challenges Samuel, don't go by the height and his stature and his appearance because man looks on the outward appearance, but God sees the heart. That's a reminder to us all. One, make sure we don't adopt mindsets of those around us. God's given us clarity and understanding and revelation. Stay with the revelation. Stay with the truth, the thing that you have uh, learned and heard and seen in me, the Apostle Paul told Timothy. You stay with it. Stay with the truth. Don't be uh, influenced by the thinking of those around you. And then number two, the Lord lets him know this is why it's so important, Samuel. Because man and God see differently. Man looks outwardly, but I can see the heart. The scripture lets us know that as in the, in the book of Isaiah chapter 55, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are God's thoughts than our thoughts and his ways than our ways. We have to adopt and grow and learn the thoughts and the ways of the Lord God and become like our heavenly father rather than, rather than staying with the base, low, beggarly ways of the world. Lord, help us today. Oh, glory to God. Look what happens in the next verse. Uh, then Jesse calls uh, his, his, uh, his next son. Here's Abinadab, calls him out and made him pass before Samuel. Samuel said, no. No, this isn't the one. Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Look at verse 9. Then Jesse made Shammah uh, pass before him. And he said, nah, the Lord hasn't chosen this. <laughs> so again, Jesse has all of his sons passing before Sammy, passing before Sammy. Oh, how important it is that we follow God and not the thing that is our familiar, comfortable, our usual uh, comfort zone type approach, we have to arise to the ways of God and not fall into the rut of the familiar and the routine. Glory to God. God here is challenging uh, his prophet. His prophet is learning while he's there doing this job of anointing the king. God dealing with him, pulling him before him, and now Samuel is following the unction of the Spirit of God and not his natural eyes. Oh, glory to God. And so each one comes and he says, no, the Lord didn't choose him. The next one comes. Yes, no, the Lord didn't choose him. Let, no, the Lord didn't choose him. And that's how all of us should do. We should progress and grow. When God challenged uh, Samuel there in verse 7, Samuel submitted himself to the challenge of the Lord so he could be used of God for his will. You and I. My brothers, sisters, and friends, we too have to respond to the challenge of God so that we can now be shifted in line with God's will and way and not our own. Oh, glory to God. We don't want to be blind seeing things through human eyes only and not through the eyes of the Spirit. He recognized that the Lord has not chosen any of these. What courage it took Samuel to do that. Because he told Jesse, Jesse, bring your sons because the Lord has chosen one of them. Well, 
It could have easily been that under the pressure of all the sun standing around and Jesse too, they're like, well, you said, we didn't tell you to come. You came and knocked on the door, so to speak, and said the Lord. So if the Lord is not going to choose one, what's going on? Samuel had to stand true. The Lord didn't choose any of these. Look what happens in verse 11. Samuel has the courage of his conviction. Lord, help us today. That's a word for somebody. We have to stand for what God said and stood on the conviction of the Spirit in him, letting him know, Spirit of God on him, dealing with him. Samuel, it's none of these. So Samuel says to Jesse, and which seems a strange question. You already said, bring your sons. And Jesse brings his crown. You would presume these are all. But Samuel, oh glory to God, stood courageously and said, Jesse, are these all your sons? What a question to ask a man. And Jesse said, well, there remaineth the youngest one, and he's out keeping the sheep. Oh, glory to God, glory to God. <laughs> your blessing may be from an unexpected place. Oh, glory to God. Not the oldest son and not one of the middle sons, but the youngest. Nobody would expect the youngest to be anointed. They would expect the oldest. But man's expectation and man's way is often not God's way. David's been out there obediently keeping his father's sheep, writing sweet songs unto the Lord, worshiping to the king, coming to know God, time and personal solitude fellowship with the Lord. Oh, listen, obedient service and worship, hallelujah, David spent time, and when you read those Psalms, it has Old Testament scripture in it. No doubt out there, David had the scrolls reading the word of God and writing songs and singing and worshiping. Listen, that's a combination there. Time with God. The people say, I'm in a hurry, I'm in a hurry. Listen, no matter what, we need to make time. There's got to be personal, one-on-one -on -one time with God. And David spent it uh, in he had to study the word of God so he could write songs, songs relating to the word of God, and then worship and playing his instrument. That worship and prayer and time with God made David inside what man couldn't see outside. Oh, glory to God. Lord, help us today. And so, Lord, I look, verse 11. Samuel said, Jesse, oh, these are all your sons. He said, yeah, they remain with the youngest, and he's out keeping the sheep. And look what Samuel says. Samuel said to Jesse, send and fetch it, for we're not going to sit down till he comes hither, which means till he comes here. How beautifully symbolic it is, Samuel boldly stands upon what the Lord said, and not only uh, inquired of Jesse, don't you, are these, is this a, are these all your sons? But now says, go send for the other one, and we're not sitting down till he comes. No doubt Samuel has an unction. Oh, glory to God, that this one that's about to come, oh, this is the one. Oh, blessed be God. And how symbolically beautiful it is, because, you know, when a king enters a room, all should be standing in honor of him. <laughs> and so all the brethren, even the father, are standing when the king, David, the boy, the teenager, Comes through the door. Oh, is anybody as happy as I am? Help me shout hallelujah. David, the Bible says he comes in. Here's how they describe it. Look at uh, verse 12. And he sent and he brought him. Now he was ruddy. This is King James. He was ruddy and withal of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And what this means, ruddy is like he has a healthy glow. Some say kind of like a red cheeks. A healthy glow about him. He's handsome. He's good to good looking. Hallelujah. David comes through the door. And so he has these physical acumen, but he's chosen of the Lord. And look at the end of that verse 12. And the Lord says to Seth, arise. This is the one. <laughs> All go into action now. Take your horn of oil that you brought. Oh, glory to God. This is him. Oh, precious saints, how necessary it is that we follow God's way. Rome, uh, Proverbs 14, 12. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. We can't follow what we think. We'll end up in death. But when we follow the Lord, we end up in life. 
how beautiful it is. And look at verse 13. Samuel took the horn of oil and he anointed David in the middle of his brethren, in their presence. They all saw it happen. The sufferings and the sacrifice and the labors in our personal walk with God, like unto David, sort of like uh, uh, the 40 years that Moses spent back out in the desert of Midian when he had left Egypt all those 40 years, keeping his father-in-law's sheep, and he's out there laboring and seems like this is it. But God was preparing him to have, know how to lead sheep in a wilderness, <laughs> starting with natural sheep, to prepare him to be able to lead spiritual sheep, where? In a wilderness. Oh, glory to God. Moses was well acquainted with the happenings in a wilderness. Hallelujah. So that after they crossed the Red Sea, the wilderness did not overthrow him because he was prepared. Look now here, uh, uh, the Lord had David out keeping his father's sheep. Hallelujah. Natural sheep. Worshiping. Praising God. And we know the story. Time won't allow. Slew the lion. Slew the bear because of his commitment to the natural sheep. All of this preparing him to be a leader of God's people, the spiritual sheep. Oh, glory to God. And so the scripture says here that what he had suffered now, uh, uh, all the little sacrifices that David uh, went through and all that he had suffered uh, naturally out there while keeping his father's sheep, now he's rewarded openly. Scripture says uh, that uh, those that uh, basically in their prayer closet and, and those that labor, hallelujah, those that do those things in secret, God will reward them openly. Now David, with all of his brothers around, is anointed to be the king. Wow, that's amazing. And not only that, but the spirit of the Lord comes upon David from that day forward. And when Samuel now has completed his assignment, he returns and he goes back to Ramah. Glory to God. Once we've done what the Lord told us to do, we're not to come up with a new agenda. Amen, obey the Lord, complete the assignment and obey the sweet king. We know there's a story, praise God, in the Old Testament of a young prophet who God had told him, do this, do this, and when you finish, you leave town. But he let somebody talk him into staying around too long, and he lost his life. Here, Samuel fulfills his assignment. He's grown, he's strengthened, he's experienced. Ah, follow the spirit. And he goes on back home, and here in the house of Jesse, Bethlehem means house of bread. God raised up a king that came out of the house of bread for a nation, Israel, that's hungry for somebody that knows the living God. Precious saints, we, we thank God for his sweet word. Lord, we love you. We bless you. We praise you. Bless my brothers, sisters, and friends far and near and help us to learn these sweet principles in your word and let your word find a hiding place in us. Let it bring forth fruit a harvest. Let the word we've heard today produce something in us that brings forth fruit and a harvest that honors your son. This we pray in the name of Jesus. And if you don't know Christ, receive him now. Leave your old life behind. Confess, Lord, I've sinned. Forgive me. I believe and know Jesus is your son. He died, but he rose again. I take him to be my Lord and Savior. Leave your old life behind. Follow Jesus. Join a Bible-believing, preaching, and teaching church and live for the sweet king. Let me remind everybody that the God of the Bible is real. Prepare for your divine appointment with him. It's coming. God bless you until next time. Mm -hmm.